Good afternoon and welcome to today's uh, energy seminar. We have with us today um, an old friend of mine, not too old, a good friend of mine, Tom Rutherford from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, I've known Tom since about 1980-ish. No, it's just n, n years ago uh, we met. Um, Tom was actually a student here and uh, since then has had a very prolific career, uh, which took him first to the university, uh, University of Toronto, then to CU Boulder, then to e ETH in Switzerland, and now finally to uh, the University of Wisconsin. Tom is probably the preeminent uh, uh, person who models both trade and energy, environment, and climate change. It's a very unusual combination. He may even talk a little bit about that today, but it's a pretty big subject because the models are fairly different. Uh, fortunately, Tom is an expert on modeling methodology, so he does both uh, sides of that game using somewhat different uh, techniques. Uh, so uh, Tom is also a former uh, Peace Corps uh, volunteer and still goes back uh, to see if his bridge is still standing in Kathmandu uh, 25 or 30 years later. So he's a very well-rounded guy. I think I remember you're also a musician um, as well, but won't admit it now. Right? Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, Tom's going to talk to us today about um, capital malleability, which probably seems pretty arcane, but it has to do essentially with um, turning over and or modifying the energy system infrastructure, which seems to be a very important uh, thing to know about uh, these days. Uh, so he's going to talk about that. And actually, his co-author on this paper is Christoph Boringer, who did do a talk just about a year ago in this seminar on a big trade study that they ran for the Energy Modeling Forum, which is one of my projects. So with great thanks to Tom for that as well. So without further ado, Professor Tom Rutherford. Boy, it's, it's really fun to be back to Stanford. And um, it's, I have... so. I'll try to keep myself on a short leash because I can sort of go off on tangents about how great it was to be a student here. But I, all I can say is like, really enjoy yourself because it's really, it's a great place to be a student. I came here in 1980 thinking I was going to learn how to uh, run development projects on large scale. I had heard about this thing called the, the critical path method and that I thought, oh yeah, I'll learn about that and then we'll go off and do stuff. So, and it wasn't, it was really um, a matter of meeting Alan Mann, who was, uh, yeah, so basically one thing led to another. Before I knew it, I was here for the duration, and uh, I really liked it, and I learned a lot. And I still, I, I guess, putting the, the talk together today, I have this urge to give a talk where I talk about ideas that have sort of came across, came in across the uh, transom at different points and how they stay with you for a long time. So you can have challenge, little challenges that come across that are interesting. And one of them was putty clay. So putty clay, I'll talk a little bit about what that is and how it works. And then I'm going to report on this paper. And it's a little bit embarrassing to be giving a paper that's really not ready for prime time. But it's, it's, the idea of the paper was motivated by this notion that putty clay was something which was fundamental and omitted from Nordhaus's dice model. And we should show people about how important this is to the social cost of carbon. And it turns out, after doing all the analysis, we can find circumstances where it matters. But in most cases, I think Bill made the right choices about how he set up the model. So in some ways, this is sort of reassuring, perhaps, to the climate community that the approach has some uh, settings. But I'm going to explain what that is and how it works. I, uh, I tend to be a little bit just driven by what I find interesting. And I end up talking about that. So my co-author, Christoph, kept saying, Make sure to bring it back to what the issues are and talk to a broader audience. And so I'm, but I'm sort of inherently sort of like, I'm curious about how things work and I'm trying to try to inspire, provide a little bit of inspiration about how you go about looking at stuff. And maybe somebody is interested in the modeling end enough to, to make it worthwhile. But anyway, so I'll, I'll do my best. So the motivation here has to do with emissions and efficiency improvements and how we think about what the consequences are of mitigation measures to reduce carbon emissions. So the basic sort of story has been, uh, for me, goes back to uh, Ada Macro, 
which again was not that far from this very site. What was it called the Slack, the three, the IBM 360? Where remember that where that machine was? I think that was was right. It was down the street from Terman, not that far from here. Uh, we had a so when I arrived in 1980, we had uh, a model, Ada Macro. The model lived in a shoebox in the corner of one of the TAs or the RAs offices. It was a stack of cards. It was like this long. So if you wanted to do a run, then you'd go out and type in new cards with new data or what other, or you might do something really brave and change an equation or two. And we'd put it in the box and you'd bring the box to the IBM 360 and you run it through and then the next morning you get there at eight o'clock and you get a stack of printouts on 11 by 17 paper telling you what had come out back from the thing. And sometimes it would say, you know, formatting error in line three or sometimes, sometimes you get interesting results, but it was really hard. And I, perhaps the biggest thing I contributed to Data Macro was convincing Alan that we should pay for uh, disk space on the deck 2060 that was over in Margaret Jack's Hall and we ported the thing over to Digital Fortran and got the thing to run there. And that was a big change because suddenly it became a much more uh, uh, engaging way to interact with the model. You could make changes and so forth. So anyway, that was the, the uh, Ada Macro model, which was mainly looking at energy shocks. And that led to Global 2100, which was a, uh, a model that was the basis for Mann and Ritchell's 1992 book on, on integrated assessment, looking at, at issues. At the same time, Bill Nordhaus was at Yale, and that's almost ex exactly the same time, was working on the DICE model. And DICE, as we could see, it really ended up dominating the dialogue about this. And I would say, largely, the reason is because Bill is such a good writer, and he's a very clear thinker. And uh, he's not a modeler. I mean, Alan was not a great modeler, pretty good at modeling, but, but basically, Nordhaus was not a modeler, but he basically knew how to ask the right questions. He's very careful and you know, um, would be systematic about how to do things. So I'm gonna look here at an ongoing dialogue we had about my malleability. It goes back to my, our initial discussions with Bill in 1985. I remember a dis uh, conversation about, does malleability matter? You know, and when, and when, when does it not matter? So that's the thing we're ultimately trying to interested, interested in understanding is how do the policy designs that come from a um, model where you assume that the techniques you use for doing things can be changed overnight to a model where you account for the fact that it takes time to, to recover, how does, that, you know, how does that matter in a putty clay world? And how does this affect the cost of abatement? So this is this degree of capital mobility is crucial to the ease and thus the structural adjustment that's gonna be required for ambitious policies. If we think about net zero or other things that are looking for aggressive policies in the short run, then that's where that we anticipate that this uh, effect really matters. And this is oftentimes it's sort of a standard sort of um, uh, reference is to simply say sort of premature retirement of capital is often trotted out as being the main cost of a climate of a overly aggressive policy is like, oh, we're going to have to walk away from all this capital. But in fact, in most cases, if you think about, certainly in the case of carbon, that's what has to happen, right? You have a whole large fleet of coal firing plants. You can't, if you, you know, there was a, what's the statistic I remember it was 2006, China installed, in, new installation of generating capacity in China was the equivalent of one quarter of the US whole fleet in one year. So there's this large sort of group of plants out in there. And the question is, how do we abate things? And that's going to come down to how rapidly does the quasi rent on that capital fall to zero? At what point does the cost of, of uh, the, the embodied carbon cause this to want to go away? So that's the main sort of idea. And then the third thing we'll make a point out here is has to do with the fact that putty clay matters the most when you have uncertainty. That means, so it's not the sort of uncertainty that typically arises in integrated assessment where you say, we're gonna, we don't know about these parameter values, we're gonna run the model a zillion times and look at all the results. It's instead uncertainty where you don't know the decision makers in the model are uncertain about the future and they have to hedge against possible outcomes. So when there's hedging, that means that they anticipate the fact that the decisions I make today have consequences for what I'm able to do tomorrow. And that's, that's 
where putty clay really plays a, an important role because you get one choice, like how much electricity do I use? How much non-electric energy do I use? What, what type of capital do I install? Do I buy a, uh, do I buy an old gasoline car? Do I buy a new gasoline car? Do I buy an electric car? I mean, these, these sorts of decisions are all sort of putty clay. The putty clay model captures those things. And when there's uncertainty is when this, this matters the most. Because if you're in a putty putty world, I buy the electric car today, lo and behold, it turns out that they come up with direct air capture technology such that the problem goes away. I can't simply flick my, I can't change over to, to I can't reverse my decision, right? So there are two aspects. Before I go further with putty clay, I'll come back to that. I just want to emphasize two aspects of the climate problem, which are important to bear in mind. And I'm sure students who are working on this are aware of this. But I, the, the two things, and I try to give you some examples to argue about why this is. These are important issues. One thing is that climate change operates on a very different time scale than economic activity. So a long a long-term investment in economics is like 30, 40 years. A, most of these climate events play out over a period of a century. I mean, there's, things can happen rapidly, but we'll see. The second thing is there's a high degree of variability. So there's lots of uncertainty in the, sh in the short term as well. So we have this seasonal variations in temperatures on the order of 25 degrees centigrade, whereas over the period of a century, you might have the average temperature going up by one or two degrees. So there's this, both of these things contribute to nature of the problem. If I think about the time structure, this is a comparison between the return to investments in economics, ec an economic investment, where we have a sort of middle of the road, road depreciation rate of say about 7%. You have an a, uh, interest rate that's three or 4%. And here we're looking at two comparable investments. The dashed line shows the investment in physical capital, economic investment, and the black line shows the investment in environmental capital. So you can make an investment in environmental capital by not emitting carbon today. And the idea of the investment is you don't emit carbon, you have a marginal impact on temperatures and damage in the future. And that this compares the time trend of those things. We see that this is the key point is that the time horizon over the environmental investment is much, much longer. It simply has a long tail. They, it's set up so that the area under the curves is roughly the same, but basically you have a very different uh, profile. Uh, a little bit of math, I don't know. I, I wasn't sure how much math to do. but it, So think about understanding this effect. You say, well, we're going we're gonna, to uh, abate carbon today, and that's going to affect the temperature in the future. Well, how do you do that? Well, you can do that. And you could either think about it by just rerunning the model. That's the way that most of the integrated assessment models, you perturb the emissions and look at what happens. Or you can also just run a single nonlinear program to retrieve that. So here I have a a function where I'm looking at maximizing the temperature at a given point in time, t hat, in the future. We have this vector s that's the state of the climate, and there's many components of that. So we have an n vector characterizing the state of the climate in year t. And we're going to temperature is one of those states. And we have emissions. And the key thing is that if you tell me emissions and you tell me the initial state of the climate, then that tells me what the temperature is over time. But so, so that means that temperature is not going to change. But if we solve this problem, we get back a Lagrange multiplier on emissions over time that tells us, that Lagrange multiplier tells us the change in temperature at that point in the future with respect to emissions at a given point in time. So you can set up the model and retrieve the whole profile of how emissions in one ton of carbon less today, how many degrees centigrade does that change the temperature in the future? And so when you do that using either of the models, so here in this, um, uh, in this analysis, we're working with both the DICE climate model and another one that came out recently in Nature. Um, the um, I forget. Anyway, so that's a different one. But both of them have this property that if you emit carbon, that, that carbon uh, affects temperature long, a long way into the future, essentially like it's a permanent change in temperature. And furthermore, that's operating on a time scale such that the time scale that matters to economic decisions, say an annual time scale, is basically doesn't matter in the climate. In other words, here I compare, and you can't even see the difference because the lines are the same, but here I compare a, a one, a five, and a 10-year 
uh, time scale on the climate model, and it doesn't change the, the economics of the thing doesn't change. The overall gradient is driven by the climate time scale, and the other stuff is not doesn't really matter. So therefore, the number of years per period, again, if we're looking down the list of stuff that Bill did right, 10-year time intervals, if you're thinking about climate, that's the main sort of effect. Of course, then we have, we interact this gradient that tells us how temperature changes depending on climate emissions with assumptions about what's the discount rate, what's the damage function, how much does, how much does damage go up, what happens to GDP. So there are all these factors that describe how much economic activity is at risk. And if you bring together those economic variables, present value prices, GDP, damage function, those things are all different. And then you end up getting a social cost of carbon that brings back all those damages in the future. But one of the things when you do this gradient calculation is this gives you a way to understand where exactly does the damage come from, right? In other words, I emit an additional ton of carbon today. How much of that is damages that's experienced by my kids? How much of it is experienced by my kids' kids? You know, in, in other words, if I were to bribe someone in the future for having the right to emit more carbon, if I had an ability to make a transaction and say, here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pay $85 and I'm gonna emit an additional ton of carbon, then that's, that's something they'd be willing to accept. This profile then, from the temperature profile, gives you a handle on how that, so this is from 2020, that's the damages, the damage profile. 20, 2030, then the profile goes up higher. 2040, the profile goes up higher. So this is showing what's happening over time with an on, against the backdrop. And if we normalize that by the emissions over time, so if we're in the first best world, then the damage function is gonna be coming down. But if we normalize it by the emissions profile, these are fairly stable. So basically the overall profile, and this is just making, I'm just making the point that in, this, in these models, we're, we're, we're bringing, when we do an integrated assessment model, we're bringing back future damages to the present, and that's not only looking at the social cost of carbon as a single number, but it actually, in addition to that, we get a, a profile over time of where, where the damages occur. The seasonal variation, I'll just point out that seasonal variation dominates Van der Weyde's local warming model estimated with Madison data. So this, this is just to remind ourselves that we have, now of course this varies around the world, some places have more seasonal variation than others, but if you look at, uh, for many places in the US, this is not that uncommon, that the variation, the black line is the estimated, uh, is the estimated temperature change. The blue line shows the actual variations over these years. I, I forget, I can't really, this is not exactly fitting, I guess I should. It's, uh, so that's over, over years. And then we have, then the, the, uh, the red line shows the linear trend that's going on that comes from the, the uh, climate estimation. So that's sort of the background. That's what integrated assessment is a framework where you can make a simple assumptions about, you, you can have a model that characterizes temperature response to climate. You can pour in assumptions about damage, damages. You can pour in assumptions about GDP growth, population growth, and then that gives you a framework for assessing what the damages are that are induced in the future by activities today for the present. And the challenge we're thinking about now is, okay, so if we're in this sort of world where we're doing thinking about best response, what's the best reply? That's a world where we have to think about how costly it is to get from here to there. And the fact that we have a dynamic model doesn't mean that we know very much about what the adjustment cost is. The adjustment cost is sort of separate. The fact that we keep track of what happens to capital in every period, that's sort of, um, that's not enough to tell you what the speed of adjustment. So speed of adjustment really comes back to life Johansson. Um, I, I uh, spent uh, a couple of years in Bergen, uh, sort of between my master's and my PhD, working at the Norwegian School of Economics. Um, had a really fun time there. It was with a project run by Victor Norman, Agnar Sanmo. But all the guys at Handels High School, their main sort of competition was at the University of Oslo, was Leif Johansson. Now, he, he passed away shortly after I arrived, but his modeling work was really profoundly influential. And uh, it's kind of interesting because I, in Norway, in fact, all over Europe, I'd say Johansson and Tinbergen were the two economists that had the biggest influence. And yet Johansson was really kind of unknown in America. And I didn't, until I, 
was putting together slides for the talk. I looked at Wikipedia. I didn't. I did never knew this before. That the reason you don't. He's not known in the U.S. is he wasn't allowed to come here because he was in the Communist Party in Norway, and therefore he was not granted a visa to, to visit. So it's kind of amazing. Anyway, so he was the guy who had this basic idea about keeping track of of vintaging capital, and I'll explain how that works. So this this vintage models have this predominant assumption of factor substitution. Here we're thinking about labor and capital, but it really labor and capital is not where most of the action is. If you think about vintaging, it's going to matter a lot in terms of either emissions or energy use, these things that are, that are the crucially uh, important factors that drive economic output. So both of the, and the, the key thing is that we have to keep track of an ex-ante production surface and an ex-post. And the key idea here is that you get a choice. So here in this uh, Hughes paper from 72 makes this trade-off when you think about the labor capital, the factor intensity, the labor intensity of output. So labor, the ratio of labor to capital. As we increase labor inputs, there's diminishing returns is the key assumption. So as you get, as you add in more labor, it takes more and more capital to hold output at the same level. And the key point idea here in Putty Clay is this idea when you pick a labor capital ratio, x1, x2, x3, you go up to the ex-ante curve and you read off what the output is at that point per unit. And that's going to be held the same over all subsequently. That's going to be the way you have to operate the technology. So the amount, the decision is made once at the beginning about where you're going to be in the isoquant. And after that, you have to live with that choice. So if you think about the trade-off, and now I'm getting back to this sort of idea about the trade-off between Mann's approach to integrated assessment and Nordhaus's approach. Uh, Mann had this idea that we have to be concrete about things. One of his favorite, um, it, some of his favorite interactions were with Cha Chauncey Starr, who was the, the, uh, the, the uh, scientist who was um, basically in charge of EPRI. And they basically had this notion that we want to think about exactly what the solution is to these problems. And you think about energy or you think about climate. And Alan was a big fan. I remember having a discussion with him actually in 86 where he was talking about, no, no, it's all about elect you have to decarbonize electricity and electrify everything. That was the basic sort of story. And this, this was something. So his idea was that the DICE model was really not adequate because it didn't capture the essence of what the message is we had to send about how to deal with climate change. So Alan early on got this idea, no, we have to find ways to produce electricity which are low carbon, and then electricity is, a much, is, is the one technology you have that can replace the existing energy thing. So that was the basic notion in Merge, was this idea that we think about, track what's happening to technologies in different places. It's multi-regional, so it can ba basically look at, at uh, burden sharing issues. And it also had this electric generation and non-electric energy. Now, there were certain shortcuts that were made in Merge. So Merge did not keep track of capital stocks of electricity and non-electric energy. So a number of things that are, that are not perfect about it. It's been improved. I'd say that the heir to Merge is probably uh, is, uh, Jeff, Blanford. Jeff Blanford's model for the US is probably the closest to this. It has a lot of, of, of interesting detail. And so the thing is that it lives on in the US dialogue. Um, but the basic sort of notion of merge was this idea that we have this trade-off between capital and labor and between electric and non-electric energy. And then the key thing is that we have these technologies and fuels that go to energy cost. And then on the up, so on the, on the input side, there's putty clay going on between how much electric and non-electric uh, energy you have per unit of output as well as how much labor and capital. And that gives you a short run, uh, slow response. Over time, then, this can drive demands for different fuels and different costs. Of course, then, it's an integrated assessment model, so it captures both emissions and what happens to climate. And the key point here is what's, how much does technology drive things? So this policy versus no policy uh, dimension, you also have this technology versus no technology. So it gives you a framework for thinking about the value is of a new technology. And this is... It's a framework that basically drives the basic virtues of these models is you have the explicit representation of the problem. You have a framework for, for, for uh, assessing alternative approaches. Um, there's this logical appeal of the, of the equilibrium framework. <laughs> you have an explicit climate and technology constraints. 
you can in, introduce risks of uncertainty and can all, all these various factors can be in, embedded. The problems are there's oftentimes a misunderstanding of what the issues are and what the model's capabilities are. Um, I'd say that's the main, the main message I'd say for modesty is important. So the simpler the model, the better. Um, the framework doesn't, you know, basically if we move away from optimizing behavior, then things get really complicated really fast. Um, and you also have to sort of understand all this underlying economic theory and so forth, and that's, that's a challenge. And so this black box approach is, becomes difficult, right? So, and this is where it goes back to this, this great paper from 85 about the, the energy modeling model, about the role of uh, what the, what's the role of model, models in the policy process, right? Analysts gain access to policy making on the basis of what they know, and models provide a framework for assessing that. His paper is about the, you know, how models get evaluated. It's this just tick boxes of what's in the model, and also about the misuse of models as symbols, right? So there's, there's a variety of different things from this paper I think are relevant. My approach to models so is this idea that they provide a framework for second order agreement, and the idea of the model, we have to be humble about what we can achieve. The idea is if you're trying to make a claim about an issue, then you should be able to, uh, the existence of a model that sub substantiates a particular point of view should be a sufficient condition, but not a necessary condition. In other words, before I listen to your story, I want to see a set of assumptions gives rise to that story. Part of this goes back, and again, I, I threw in these slides at the last minute because this is something, uh, there's very few things in graduate school you can remember. I can remember precisely the day of this lecture this was uh, David Leuenberger. Uh, it, Leuenberger was an electrical engineer who was quite famous. There's this thing called the Leuenberger Observer. It was all about control theory. And somehow, and I, don't, I never knew him that well, but he somehow had this idea he's going to learn economics. And he decided he's going to join the EES department and teach economics. And so th at that time, there was like three or four different economics classes you could take. You know, Kreps taught the course over in the business school. There was a class in the econ department. But Leuenberger's class was so great. The guy was so clear and precise. He, it was old school, so he used Varian's book. But one of the things, he, he introduced this idea. We had to, he assigned a problem where we had to do something. And he said, well, let me explain how you use a model. And then he proceeded to, to bring in this, make reference to the 50th anniversary of the Golden Gate Bridge. So the Golden Gate Bridge was going to be open to pedestrian traffic for the first time ever. It had never been opened, pedestrian traffic. This was something I'd worked as a bridge engineer in the Peace Corps, so I was kind of aware of this, that trucks are about 150 kilograms per square meter. Human beings, particularly if they're having fun together, 400, 500 kilograms per square meter, they can get really heavy. So the question was, is it safe? And so there were several different proposals for how to go forward with that. One of them was a reduced form method where you keep track of strain gauges on the bridge keep track of how many trucks are there, try to predict what's going to happen from the strain gauges to what, whether it's going to, how much it deflects. The other approach was to say, let's, uh, let's use a finite element model, characterize the characteristics of all the pieces of steel on the bridge, and then use that to simulate what happens. And the key thing is this, is this notion of this ex post versus ex ante assessment. And you know, the, of course, the predictions were from the uh, structural model were much closer to what actually the deflections were that were observed. And so that, I thought that this model sort of captures the idea about why we want to you know, have a framework for looking at things. So now we go back to DICE. And so I'm thinking, OK, well, let's look at the DICE model. Let's think about the social cost of carbon. And let's assess how robust this is to our assumptions about putty clay. That was our original idea. The, the Canadian Environment Ministry wanted us to assess, um, so have a perspective on social cost of carbon. We said, fine. We'll, We'll use this, an extension of this. We have a, other versions of this model. Many, there are many, many versions of DICE around. But here we're going to basically be thinking about putty clay and the notion about how much abatement we undertake. So that means the abatement decision is not made in every period, but it gets remade for new vintage capital. So when you install a new capital, you have to buy additional costs are undertaken, and that induces additional costs down the line. You have to pay those costs in, in full, and that gives you a framework for understanding how the decisions we make today affect the future. Okay, so the, our version will be one that works on an annual time step. 
We need that in order to look at um, sort of aggressive policy in the short run. Um, it incorporates sort of putty clay uh, capital adjustment. And it, it also is going to incorporate policy uncertainty under either learn then act or act then learn settings. So learn then act is where we basically, you can do a lot of bunch of simulations, different assumptions, and then make a decision at that point. The act and learn says we have to make decisions initially and live with the consequences of those outcomes. So the research questions we're interested in is how does that influence the cost of intermediate climate policy and such as net zero by 2050? How does the social cost of carbon depend on assumptions regarding capital malleability? How does the revelation of increased climate damages affect near-term abatement? To what extent do model responses depend on putty-putty and versus putty-clay capital adjustment? And then uh, how does this affect, how are these things affected then by policy uncertainty? And that's one of the things I think I find interesting is that there's always this rolling, if you've worked on this for a while, there's this rolling horizon. And this is, I think, a characteristic of the political process is that there's always aggressive policy claims are made, but they always are at some point in the future. And then the, the affected parties, those who have a, have a ox to get gored by the policy, they're always, they're not necessarily engaging the, the debate about what's the appropriate thing, but they're always trying to roll the horizon out further. And was it at one of the sporting events, I forget what it was, uh, last year's Super Bowl, the Exxon ad sort of talking about 2070 objectives. It's like, you know, always pushing things forward. And so that's the idea here is to think about how does uncertainty about when we actually get serious about climate affect things. I should say that this week's announcement by EPA sort of changes things. There's, this, is, this talk was motivated by, by relatively um, modest objectives where there seems like they're, they're actually getting more serious about it, which is a good, uh, important sort of dimension. So here in this analysis, we're going to do some sensitivity analysis where we think about, in order to identify what matters, we're going to think about the climate cycle. So we have this other alternative model to DICE, this FAIR model we've calibrated. And then we have the capital mobility, and that affects sort of the abatement policy. So this, and this is all based on this Ramsey model. It's a Ramsey growth model, which is combined with simple climate model and produced a framework for cost benefit. Uh, one of the things that's important to bear in mind with the Ramsey model, let's see if I got the next, I don't, where did I put the objective function? Well, there's, I'll just do it here. So if you think about what we're doing is we have a, uh, you have a objective function that says, maximize the sum over t of uh, L sub t divided by 1 plus delta to the t times u of c sub t over L sub t. So this is a utility function is diminishing, ex exhibits diminishing marginal utility. It goes like this. It actually goes down to minus infinity. And this is going to be as a function. So this is u as a function of c divided by l. So c over l is, is per capita consumption. This is the population. This is a discount factor that puts less weight on, on future generations. So this is, a, this is uh, something that's quite controversial, what the lo right level of delta is. But the key point here is that this is uh, a model that's looking over time. And in the DICE framework, it's looking at average sort of global consumption divided by, so this is per capita global consumption. If we, if we take this model and put in heterogeneity across, across households, then the dominant effect is also to do with redistribution within time. In other words, the differences in income across, around the world are huge compared to what we have that's induced by climate. So it's important to bear in mind we're working in a very, uh, it's a very constrained box that we're working in for thinking about this. Uh, problem. Um, okay, so so this is then looking at the abatement in the ex ante curve on the right hand on the left hand side. We show what the GDP costs are per unit of abatement, and on the right hand side, I'm just emphasizing the fact that this trade off between capital, labor, and energy or emissions has to do with the point you're going to be operating on this curve, and once you make the decision, you're stuck with that. So aggregate production then depends on capital and labor, and that's going to be in the putty-putty model. It's an aggregate effect. In the putty-clay model, the output in a given period is a combination of output from extant vintages, yx sub t is 
things that existed before the start of the model. Uh, y n sub t is going to be the new vintage production you introduce in that time period. And y v sub t is going to be vintage production that's stuff that's been installed since the beginning of the model, but it's updated. So that's going to be y v sub t is, is, represents all the investments that have occurred beginning at the first part of the model. So the key thing is, and this is, we get back to the, the framework thinking about, um, the, again, thinking about Chinese investment in coal-fired plants. Here you think about the fact that the extant production is a result of the, of the characteristics of all the existing fleet. And so here, in, to take the, dice, the uh, DICE model and put in vintaging, you have to keep track of what the outputs are of all the previous vintages that are operating at that point in time and what their emissions are. So part of the model is understanding what is the quasi-rent which is lost if you walk away from an old capital stock from previous years. And so that's going to be uh, represented here. And this is this idea that we have to make a decision. The endogeneity of the, the abatement decision here is not going to just be how, how efficient do we make new cars. It's also when do we discard the existing cars? And so that's the decision here, which says that the vintage output in period tau is going to be, one, is going to be less than or equal to 1 minus delta times the vintage of out, output in the previous period. And so therefore, that, if that constraint is slack, if it's not an equality, that means that you're making a decision to, to walk away from capital. So that, and that's part of the abatement measures. And if we think about policy measures on the table saying we want to go to, to zero emissions over a relatively short period, that's something that has to be operational to the decision. And that's something that it's a uh, characteristics of the model, which is not estimated. That's something that has to be parameterized. You have to know what is the invest, what are the characteristics of the existing, I guess mainly it's going to be the automotive fleet and the uh, generating capacity for, for, uh, for electricity. New vintage production then is a combination both of new vintage labor as well as investment. So I sub T minus one is going to be investment. LN is going to be how much new vintage labor comes into the economy. So there's a, there's going to be an aggregate labor stock. Part of it gets tied up with the existing capital. And then there's new vintage, just what happens, the people that are newly entering into the stock. And of course, you pick up additional labor if you have premature retirement. Then in the periods after you have premature retirement, that's going to be give a, a boost to what the amount available uh, new vintage labor is. And then there's also an abatement decision that's made for that vintage. Um, and finally, this is the thing that, again, um, I found really kind of mysterious when we first. It, what's amazing is that you can capture this whole sort of complexity of, of um, evolving sort of energy intensity or carbon cli climate intensity can all be captured by this equation that keeps track of how much new vintage capital you have and how much extant capital you have, V, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, vintage capital you have. And this then determines the whole sort of evolution. So basically, you make decisions about new vintage, and you have to live with that going forward. It's a little bit, um, you get this uh, property that, that essentially all the decision, the decision you make on new vintage characterizes what the cost is over the full life of the capital stock. And correspondingly, there's also emissions then that emissions in time T then is extant emissions from all like old capital stock, the new vintage emissions, and the, and the uh, existing capital you've invested before. And there also may be this script E sub T in the DICE model is emissions that come from non-energy uh, non sources. And then, uh, so this is keeping track of how this, how this evolves over time. So the putty clay framework these two four sorts of abatement, we have to basically make decisions about how much uh, we want to abate emissions in new vintage capital and how much we want to retire extant vintages. So, uh, so and that gives you the then consumption in time T is, is and plus investment is output uh, diminished by damages, diminished by abatement cost. And so the abatement cost decision is something, the abatement cost is how much you lost of output. The, the decision is if you're going to put on something that, that captures carbon, you're going to have a loss of energy efficiency. As this is capturing this idea that investment decisions affect, uh, abatement decisions affect the overall cost of the, of the, of the operation. Okay, so let's look at a few numbers. Um, not a lot, but just a few things here. Uh, Putty-putty versus putty-clay. 
Uh, think about a Ramsey model, which ignores climate entirely, a BAU model where we have a pure externality, or an optimal policy where you trade off costs and benefits. And then we also then think about how is this affected by the depreciation rate. So we have a 4% rate. It's a relatively low one. Reference rate is 7%. I think in the original DICE model, Bill used 10, but 7 is sort of closer to the, the averages in the OECD, or to have a 10% is another alternative. And then finally, we have climate, climate damages. There's this reference case from the DICE 2016, which, for which Nordhaus received a fair amount of, of flack. Uh, Hansel et al. in Nature Climate Change a couple years ago produced an alternative estimate. And then we have a couple alternative uh, learn then act versus act then learn. So if I look at what's going on along the baseline, we have uh, the climate damages uh, and capital depreciation for different emission levels. So here, if we look at the on the on the right, we have the Ramsey model, which is sort of that that's the baseline model with no uh, no climate damages. And on the right hand side, we see what the effects are of the high damage. So and this is just pointing out that the that there's separability that the baseline is, is affected, but it's relatively modest in this in this run. So in the Ramsey reference and HS dam coincide, the climate damages are ignored. In the BAU, the higher damages lead to lower output, which in turn slightly lower emissions. So it's but it's relatively these interactive effects are relatively modest. If we think about the optimal model, then it matters a lot. And so here we have the basic assumption about what the damage rates are, and that's the thing in this sort of integrated assessment framework. Um, the, the level of, of abatement is driven a lot by the damage estimates, and the damage estimates are the thing we know the least about. As it, it seems as though with every time we turn around, the damage estimates are, are perceived to be going higher, and so, that, but, and so that means that the model, to a certain extent, is going to be driven largely by that assumption. The other factors, whether or not you have reference or how much the, the depreciation rate is, that stuff is all second order compared to what the damage assumptions are. Um, so we think about that's so that's depreciation, and there's the BAU, and there's the optimal policy. So we can see that there's a little bit. The optimal policy is going to be quite a bit lower, and so damages will be quite a bit. Uh, but then emissions, or how much the overall emissions then depends a lot. And here we're looking at. So we saw that putty, putty, and putty clay, not a big difference in uh, in many aspects of the model. But over here, if we look at emissions, there's a big difference. So here, if we, the key thing is, if we're in the high damage assumption, so we have the Hansel et al. damage function. In the putty-putty model, you have an immediate drop because you can basically reform the entire capital stock. Whereas over here, if it's a putty-clay model, then you have to live. The decision to reduce emissions rapidly is the decision to walk away from existing capital. So it's going to be a much lower, the response rate is much, is much slower. Uh, the capital uh, depreciation rate, if the capital depreciation rate is lower, then you basically, if it's as low as 4%, then in the, in the putty-putty model, you may actually have uh, the overall emissions may go up over time, whereas in the putty-clay model, you can see that there's a jump there where the, the, the damage is down rapidly. So then, again, this is just looking at what the emissions are by vintage for the high damage case. So here we see uh, in the putty-putty model, it's a relatively smooth um, uh, reduction over time. Whereas in the in the putty clay model, in the putty clay model, there's a big difference. The red line shows what happens to new vintage em emissions. So this demonstrates that uh, emissions in the putty clay world, where we have to live with the fact that we can't change the entire capital stock, we can't afford to be blasé about what the amount of abatement is in the new capital. So this basically tells us that policies which mandate substantial changes in the short run for new vintage capital are not that far off given the fact that you don't have access to the entire capital stock. So that's, that sort of justifies this notion that aggressive policies, there's no real di big difference in terms of what the overall uh, social cost of carbon is, but there's a big difference in what the marginal abatement is. And that's because you know, the way to think about this is that the new vintage investments made today anticipate the fact it foresees a future where carbon prices will be rising, and so therefore the decision to abate is, is reflecting the fact that they anticipate the carbon tax rising substantially. Um, so this is just looking at emissions from extant capital, new vintage, and vintage capital. So the new vintage is going to be going down, but you can see here that 
in the abatement in the putty clay model, with, when you have an aggressive policy that's with a high damage, you're basically going to walk away from a substantial portion of your, of your extant capacity. So this is a model where you have to have some shortages. In the, if, you know, this is basically something where the, the, the mechanism you have for abatement is by uh, abandoning old capital. And uh, you want to make new capital as efficient as possible, but that by itself is not going to be enough. So finally, there's this difference between the social cost of carbon and the marginal abatement cost. In the, in the putty-putty model, those two are exactly the same. But in the putty clay model, they're different, and for exactly that reason, that the the shadow co the marginal the social cost of carbon reflects what the damages are that are experienced going out in the future, brought back to the present. That's the damage, but that's and that's going to be the, the the carbon price at that point in time. But the decision about the marginal cost of abatement, the abatement decision, is reflecting the anticipation that those prices are going up. So therefore, you have m much higher le levels of abatement in new vintage capital. And finally, we can look at, you know, we can look at uh, discounted utility through a given year and look at that in terms of what the trade-offs are. And again, with, it's going to depend on if you uh, want to have prescriptive or descriptive uh, discounting. But if you basically calibrate a model to what's existing capital, the trade-off here is basically, this is looking at the uh, consumption, investment, and overall welfare. So we're going to have a thing where the, the uh, Optimal mitigation reduce the return to capital in the short run, so you have consumption goes down, but then you have a big gain out here in the future, and that's basically capturing the fact that you're foregoing consumption in the near term to increase consumption in the long term. That's sort of that's the, the story that's being told. The gray line reflects if we use existing discounting rates, the discount rates that are present in the DICE model that are calibrated to what's observed about uh, rates of abatement, that are ra rates of uh, of it's consumption growth and interest rates. It's, it takes a long time for it to break even. So it's essentially, the, in, the, in this framework, even with the high damage case, there's a relatively long period over which the net, net gains don't add up. So the final thing, I'll just, and this is relatively bright, if we think about probabilities of going to net zero by 2050, 2060, 2070, so here we have different levels, or we may go back to the optimal policy with the probability five. So here I'm posing it as though the abatement measure, the, the net zero targets are on top of existing methods. So we write down the deterministic equivalent model. Again, I won't bore you with the details. But here we see a much bigger difference between the models. So this is this idea that if there's uncertainty, then the hedging is much more important here. Because in the putty-putty model, the idea that we're going to have a net zero, that simply says, you say, well, that's fine. Net zero is coming. We're not sure exactly when it's going to happen. But when it comes, we can drive everything to zero right off the bat. because there's lots more malleability. But if we're in a putty clay world, basically you want to act right away because you anticipate that you might be in a world where there's much higher, that re reaching that target is going to be much higher if you can't reduce emissions from existing capital because the only way you have to reach some of those targets is by walking away from a large amount of capital stock. So that's sort of capturing this idea between, and we're looking here at learn the knack versus act and learn. You can capture, you can calculate some decision theoretic metrics like the, the uh, expected value of perfect information, it's not huge. The fundamental problem is that this is essentially, you, you get big differences in terms of what happens in terms of policy, but in terms of overall cost, this is not hard. And this is just the elephant and the rabbit. The overall fraction, that's the thing that's frustrating about climate, is a fraction of overall economic activity. It's not huge. It's not a big factor, but it, it basically, it's, it's uh, something that matters. So here we've just looked at sensitivity. So I apologize for being a little bit, uh, my, uh, again, Christoph was chiding me for not getting uh, more, having a very, I mean, in some sense, this is one of the things with modeling is you do sensitivity analysis to see what matters and you may discover that it's not as big a factor as you. You can construct examples where it matters, but it's, it's basically not something I'd say. On the whole, I come away from this thinking that Nordhaus made a bunch of good decisions about his design of his model. Yeah. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, we have time for a few questions in the room now. Any Anybody have any questions they want to ask? Volunteers? No one. So uh, you actually talked about the regionality of merge and whatnot. Yeah. Have you guys actually thought about doing a regionally disaggregated 
version of this analysis given the difference in the economies that you already alluded to? What's, I mean, the only thing I just, I made a mention there of the, uh, of heterogeneity. If we think about Broom's notions of, of uh, goodness versus justice, we have these notions of trading off, you know, what, how much abatement should we undertake? We have this idea of trading off the present versus the future. But if you bring in enough poor countries, then the, the wealth differences and the income differences we have across countries dominates what the induced differences are that are induced through climate action. So the thing is, that's something that, I'm not sure exactly how to do that in this model because the model is just gonna tell you, you tell it, okay, how much should we tax carbon? You're gonna, it's gonna do something, if it gets to give the money away to developing countries, it's gonna give as much money as it can. So that, that's, that's sort of the biggest challenge. These trade issues are a big issue. Like we have a big project we're going on now about the effect of border carbon adjustments on developing countries for the World Bank. And, but that's, it's much more that, that I don't think you need an integrated assessment model to look at those issues because it's not really about, the question is here and now. So if you have a 15 year horizon, I think you've captured what is primarily in the debate. Um, yeah. Any, any questions from the audience? So the, the other one I was going to ask, we can pursue this more at dinner, is uh, in the trade uh, regime, uh, there is this concern now about whether the IRA program here and the uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism in Germany are totally inconsistent with, with each other and what to do about that. Have you guys already thought about that? No, the thing is that's definitely something that we, our, our work initially, I mean, Carolyn, Carolyn is much more aware of what the issues are. Um, but clearly that is the challenge. Like how do you ascribe, that's the challenge with climate is you can, there are all sorts of different ways to skin the cat and how you give credit for one versus the other. It has, has big fact, it has big, it matters a lot for certain industries. Yeah. Right? So the, the challenge we have in this is that the data is not even that, I mean the effect, the sectors that are most affected, we don't really know very much about the, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenging, it produces all sorts, just to get a, a, a first order estimate of the effects is, is difficult. Difficult, but yeah. uh, the, I feel like I'm in Star Wars. You, you, you guys may be our only hope in how to figure that out. Yeah. I mean, obviously Treasury needs to decide who's gonna get what credit for which uh, uh, elements in the IRA, but at the end of the day, there is this big kind of trade uh, overlay, yeah. which I think will continue to dominate in one form or another. I mean, the thing is that my the, the talk I give about trade is uh, border carbon adjustments curb your enthusiasm. Chris <laughs> so. did a little bit of that last yeah. year, but it sounds like you're a little bit more in that direction. I'm, I'm yeah. Anyways, I think the, we're just about out of time, so uh, let's thank t uh, Tom uh, one last time. If you have any questions, he'll be around for a little bit. Thanks. Thanks.